Welcome. Um, successful software teams. Awesome that so many people are here for hearing about successful software teams and not about successful technologies and stuff like that. But there's plenty of room here at JavaZone to hear about that. Um, so if we talk about successful teams, successful teams are made of, of successful people. So we need successful, good, great people in our, in our teams. Like, like these people here, these are great people that have really uh, brought our industry forward. Elon Musk, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, really successful people. And we need those developers in our teams, these superhero developers, these really, really great people. Um, I'm, I think here are plenty of, of those are here in the audience too. Um, those developers, they can develop software fast. If you give them a task, they can do it within, within, within days where other, other software developers need weeks or months for doing that. They know their shit. Um, if you sit with them in meetings, they always come up with the best ideas. You think, why didn't I have this great idea? Man, it's so obvious. Why didn't I have that? So these people are, have, have really, really great ideas. And they, they are problem solvers. So if you want to get a problem solved, you go to these people. You go to them because you know, hey, if I go to this person, I know my problem is solved within, within minutes, within hours. He knows where to look at. He knows how to fix it. Great. These people are really the problem solvers. Um, and they write so elegant code. I've been working with, with some of those people. And when, when I saw the code, I thought, oh, this is kind of a piece of art. It's really, if I write, if I, if I change it, I would destroy it. I would destroy this, this really great code. So what I did is I unheard the class and then um, changed it anyway, overwrite, overwrite the methods and stuff like that. So anyway, and if you, if you talk with them about, about a new technology that, wanna that, that you want to use, they already know this technology. You say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I've, I've actually, on my way to work, I listen in a podcast about that. I've written a blog post about that. We can use that, yeah, if you want to do that. They are the real rock stars of our industry. The really, really great people. Sometimes some people call them the, the, the tan X programmers. And we are desperately looking for those people. We want those in our, in our teams. We want our teams made of those people. So we have job advertisements that look like this. Rock star, rock develop, rock star developer needed. Yeah, let's get a rock star developer on our team. Or Ruby specialist, someone that is specialized in Ruby and knows Ruby inside out. We want those people in our team. Or my favorite, developer ninja. Yeah, funny, developer ninja. Good, let's, let's, let's hire a ninja, whatever that means. Anyway, um, but if you put those job advertisements out there, does that really attract those rock star developers? I think not because they already have a great job. They're not looking for, for, for something, for job advertisement and say, oh, they're looking for a ninja, I'm a ninja, so let's go there. That's not, that's not happening. And also, what I think is, is bad about that, that we're looking for the best of the best of the best. We're shying away other, other good developers, especially female developers. I never heard a female developer call, call themselves a developer ninja. No. And they, they, they don't call themselves experts in something. They're, they're really good developers, but they don't call themselves like this. It's mostly male they call themselves. So how do we get those, those people on, on our teams? Well, we, we, we should build an environment, actually, of, of high-performance teams that really attract those people. So if we have built an environment that empowers high-performance teams, that will attract great developers, and great developers attract great developers. Um, but why teams at all? I mean, if we have a bunch of great individual programmers, that's good enough, isn't it? Steve Jobs, he invented the Macintosh. No, he didn't. He had a whole team helping him doing that. Become this vision become true. He actually didn't do anything. He didn't develop anything on the Macintosh. Elon Musk, he invented the, the, the Tesla. No, of course not, he didn't. He had a whole team that, that uh, helped him become uh, uh, brought his vision to life. Or Mark Zuckerberg, he wrote Facebook. No, he got inspired by a lot of people actually uh, for Facebook. Oh, wrong slide, sorry. Anyway, um, 
My name is Sven. I work uh, as as an uh, evangelist or kicker, software motivator, or whatever you call that. And at Lassian, so travel around, talk about that. And I've been working in a lot of teams. And if you look at your organization, actually, um, there are a lot of teams. And you probably know that there are really, really good teams, really great teams. And if you know, if I give the task to that team, they will really nail it. And if I give it to that team, hmm, I'm not sure if they will deliver in time. So what, what makes the difference here? What makes the difference between a okay team and a high performance team? There has been a lot of investigation into that to find the secrets of high performance teams. So team A. Um, team A is a, is a very strict team. Um, I won't call it very strict, but they have their, their processes, their rules, um, and they sit in, in meetings. One is, one is speaking, asking a question, the other are answering. Um, and at the end of the meeting, five minutes before the meeting, they stop and they sum up everything that they want to do, and then they leave the room and, and work on stuff. Um, team B, a very chaotic team. Well, they, they, they are passionate, they discuss things, um, and they, they get kicked out of the meeting rooms always, and they, they start discussing, uh, they, they follow the discussion in their, in their uh, development environment. So, who's working more for team A? No one. Who's working more in a team B? Okay, most of you work in the middle, what's normal. But let me tell you this, there can be high performance teams with, with team A attitude or team B attitude. That's not a differentiator. Google has done a big, big research on high performance teams. They wanted to know how, how, what, what are high performance teams do differently. Um, and they, they tried to find patterns. They couldn't really find any. At the end, they found something. And it's, it goes like that. So high performance teams, the team members, they speak to each other. They talk to each other. And more, more importantly, they listen to each other. And this is, this is what makes the difference, actually, between a good team and a high performance team. They really work together. Um, they act in a psychological safe place. So they can say whatever they want and listen to whatever they want to, 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 to each other. Um, so this, is, this makes the difference. Um, then you need to have a, a, a good structure in your team. Um, that's also important. Another thing is that you should share the same mindset in your team, um, that you get support from the rest of the organization, also very important to be a high-performance team. And um, you need a compelling direction. You know your goals, you know your direction, your, your heading. Um, and this actually is, is, is the secret source of high-performance teams. Compelling direction, supportive context, strong structure, and a shared mindset. So this is the agenda for, to, for, for, for this talk. Um, and let's start with how to, how to do a compelling direction, how to give people a compelling direction um, that they, that they uh, follow this, this direction. Um, you probably work in, in a team and you work in an organization and a lot of people come to you and ask you, can you do this and that? And there are a lot of stuff you, you, you should do. Um, like, like this here. Hey, we want to automate deployments. Project Y is the most important one. Lower the cost. Increase the revenue. Less downtime. We need less downtime. And it, this is really tearing us uh, apart sometimes, that these different priorities come to us, and we, we actually have to, have to tackle that. We have to handle that. Um, so this is really not good. You should give people a, a, a North Star something they can look up to. So it's not really something you do this, but we are heading into that direction. And your company should have that. Your company should have a, a, a vision, the, the two-year plan. And not just your company, your team should have a two-year plan. Where's the software heading? Where do you want to go? That's, that's, that's your vision. Um, and then we came up with this idea of uh, putting, the, putting themes around the vision. What, what themes should we, should, we, should we do? And then putting focus areas in. What are we doing this year? What do we concentrate on, on this year? Are we working on, on that uh, for, are, are we really working on that? Um, and if you're in doubt, if you're working on the right thing, you can look at your focus area. So for example, we had a focus area called enterprise. So we were want to, wanted to make big customers happier um, so that was for one year our focus area, so every, for one of our focus areas. And we, last year we had a focus area called mobility, so we, we actually hired a big mobile team um, and, and brought the new Jira and Confluence mobile versions on the market. So 
These, these are focus areas, and that's now not, not anymore on our focus area on this year, so the focus area has changed, but this is really what we want to focus on. And then important is also that you measure, that you put up measurements. What, what are your success criteria? What, what do you want to reach? And then look at the end of the year, did you reach that or not? Um, and we call that vision, themes, focus, measures, or short VTFM. Our leadership thought this is a great idea. We should bring that to our developers. VTFM. Everyone should know VTFM. And they said, this year, VT what? <laughs> what that? But our, our leadership thought it's so important that everyone knows what, what, what it stands for, what it is, and why we're following that, um, that they made a video. And it looks like this. All right, VTFM. Yeah, now, now you know why we're doing software and not in the music industry or acting industry, really bad acting and music. Well, anyway, um, so it's, it's so, so important um, because actually I was, I was working for a company that had offices in, in London and in Berlin, and the London people thought we have to bring out new features. So they were building features and features. The Berlin team thought it's more important to, to, to concentrate on quality, so they are actually working on quality. Um, but it would have been good if, if someone would have said, actually, there, there was also a lot of discussion around the team, obviously, um, but it would have been good if someone would have said, okay, this year we want to attract new customers, so we need to build more features, or this year we want to stabilize our system, so we need to work more on quality. Um, now you might say, okay, yeah, that sounds very fluffy, Sven. Um, show us the real world. What does, how, how do we do that in our teams? How do we follow goals in our teams? How we, how we set this vision into, into real tasks? So we, we also uh, have another system for that um, called OKRs. And OKRs uh, is a system that also Intel and Google uses. So it is objectives and key results. Um, very, very, uh, every, every team sits together every quarter and puts, puts together their OKRs. So objective could be something like um, build a mobile app. Um, and a key result could be we want to have 1,000 daily users on the mobile app. So this is the, the key result that we want to reach. So, and then at the end of the quarter, we're looking at oh, how, how are we doing, actually? Um, how are the key results? How, how, how do we score? So we look at the score and said, OK, we got 700 daily users, not 1,000. So we score 0 0.7. But said that is this score is a stretch score. So 1,000 was really way out what we could ever imagine we can have. So if, if we score between 1.7, 1.8, uh, sorry, sorry, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, that's okay. That's good. We reached our goals. So first, set stretch goals. That stretches you. That pushes you forward. Um, then we're doing them quarterly. And quarterly is a good cadence for us because it gives teams actually... Um, the stability that they know that what they work on the next quarter, and it gives us also po the possibility to move things around uh, dur during the year um, to change priorities. And then less is more, less objective. So each objective have maybe three, four key results. So don't have more than three objectives uh, for, for a quarter. Otherwise, you get you, you go again into do this, do that, do this, so focus on that. And another really important thing is that these OKRs, these goals for the teams, they are transparent. So I just entered here OKRs FY17, and I got all the, all the teams OKRs, so the design teams OKRs, Helen's OKRs, uh, Confluence design team OKRs, so I can look them up. I can really see what, is, what, what are the goals from the team next door. 
And maybe they, our, our goals don't align, so I can go to them and talk to them and say, hey, we should align our goals, really. Um, so things look good on paper. It looks good. Yeah, this is our goal. That's where we're heading. Um, and we check in every quarter. Cool. But in between, we should make some sanity checks. If we are really going in the right direction, doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't make sense that we set our goals once and then we go for, for three months and at the end of the quarter say, oh, we didn't reach it. Damn it. So actually, um, Pixar is, if, if you had read the book, Creativity Inc., I can really recommend that. And Pixar is doing that. They have this, and, and it's, 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 it's in this book, they have this brain trust meetings where the directors come together, the creative come together, and then they're talking about the next animation movie they're doing. It's a storyline, okay, so the director of this movie is pitching the story and telling where it's going. And they have really honest discussion in that group uh, around, is that really something um, that, 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 that we're going in the right direction? And we're trying to adopt that right now. We're, we're doing some we call it product brain trust. So our founders, uh, Mike and Scott, they they take a part. Um, they they take uh, half a day each each week to invite uh, some people from a specific project, and then they can pitch their project to them and say how it's going. And these are very experienced. And we have some other people from from the from management, from experienced product managers in that in that uh, group too. And these people look at it and they have a lot of experience in, in product development. So they look at it and you get honest feedback for, for your development. So um, maybe they know how the goals are. So they know how the goals are and they align your product to the goals. And you get a fresh view actually on, on your project and you get some, some good feedback. What you get is not something that they say, okay, this, this doesn't make sense, go into another direction. You just get, get a direction from them. It's ultimately your decision. You're the project leader. It's your decision, um, your team's decision where to go. But you get honest, great feedback from experienced people. So we're trying that out. Still, this is just our ideas that we have at Atlassian. This is just what we think makes a customer happy. Um, but maybe this is not the real world. So instead of just us setting goals, let the customer set the goals and see what the customer bucks. Um, we have a value that called don't fuck the customer. And that's one of our company values, and we really mean that. And we measure constantly if people like our products or don't like our products. And nowadays, very, very um, popular is NPS scores, net promoter scores. And we're doing, doing the same thing. So you, you probably have had that where people ask you, hey, would you recommend that uh, software to a, to a friend? And if you say 9 to 10, you're a promoter, uh, 7 to 8, you're passive, and uh, detractor if you're between 0 and, and, and 6. Um, and we're measuring that. So we're asking our customers regularly through our software, hey, do you like, do, would you recommend that to a friend? Um, but this is just one source of feedback. We have a lot of feedback. So we get feedback from support, we get feedback from interviews and social media. So we're also listening on Twitter what people are saying about our tools. And we collect all that feedback. Um, but you can imagine we have tons of feedback. So this, this is really a lot of feedback. And if we read through all that, uh, our head will explode. I mean, we're reading through all that, but uh, we want to categorize that. So we were looking for, for patterns where we could fit in. So we actually found three buckets for our products where we feed, uh, put, put all the feedback in. And we call it reliability, usability, and functionality. So these are the three categories, or short, rough. So let's have a look at an uh, example here. For example, Confluence. Uh, we got 40,000 feedback items in, in two months. So this is really a lot. But if we rough it, we can really see what people box. So this is, this is the result here. 31, don't, don't like the reliability, usability 63%, um, and functionality 6%. This gives us a guidance where we should work on. We should work on usability. Of course, we can look more deeper into that, complexity, content, navigation. So we can give that feedback to the right team that works on that, or to the right product manager. So your feedback got read by, by first the, the rough team, and then the product manager, and then the team that is in there. But that's not enough. Actually, everyone at Atlassian should know what bugs, what bugs the customer. What, what, why, why don't they like, why do they like our software? So, we want to distribute all this feedback to, to every Atlassian. Obviously, 40,000 feedback items, that's a little bit too much. But what we do is we have these weekly emails where we, we put out the NPS score. So you get an email every Monday morning where you see the NPS score of, of, of our tools. 
um, you see increasing, decreasing. Um, and then we, we put the feedback from the NPS uh, scores, we put that back into, into, our, in, into the email. So everyone gets a different email. So your feedback is not read just by product managers, um, by, 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 by the team that works on that, um, but also by, by, by random Malaysian that reads their feedback and knows uh, now what the customer bugs. Um, so give your team a compelling direction. Give them a North Star, just, just, just a direction where they, where, where they should go. Um, let them follow their goals. Set goals and let them follow them and, and score at the end on the goals. Um, make some sanity checks. Are you on the right direction? And then, very important, understand the customer feedback, what the customer bucks. All right, the second ingredient for, um, for a, 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 a successful teams is that they have a strong structure, these, those teams. Talking about that. Um, I've been working for organizations that look like that. Well, the programmers sitting in one room, the operation guys in another room, the designers over there. You can go, of course, to the other room, um, but there's really a barrier between those teams. Um, but that do really doesn't make sense. If you look at, at, at movie makers, um, they sit all together to make a movie. Uh, the, the, the tone, the cameraman, the director, the light, everyone sits together. And, and make, try to make a, a great movie. It, it comes, everything must come together. And it's the same for software development. We can't sit in different rooms. We need the designer sitting together with the developers. So that's why I'm a big fan of cross-functional teams. Have designers, product managers, testers, um, de uh, developers, all in, in one team. But that doesn't mean that you just belong to one team and you have to stick with those teams. If, if those teams don't need a, a, a tester right now, he or she can go to another team and, and test there. Or uh, the designers, they belong maybe to, to, to one project team. But they, we want to have uh, 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 the same design all over our products, so they should talk to other designers. So they, they, they have their, their design teams where they go and uh, talk about the design. So you don't just have to belong to one team if you're working in a cross-functional team. You can belong to more teams. And cross-functional teams are, are so important because you want to get understand each other better. Um, so in cross-functional teams, t information flows much better because you can just scream over the desk um, and, and ask for help. Uh, you get faster decisions. You have all the decisions makers in, in one room all the time. You get a diversity of thought. Designers think differently than QA people. QA people want, want stability, they want quality. Designers want to have something fancy. Developers want, want something different. But you get a diversity of thought in your team. Um, and the most important thing, you get an understanding of each other. All these disciplines make great software. And put that, all, this uh, uh, um, all, all these differences in, in one team makes a high performance team. So as I said, cross-functional teams, great. If you put together just the same people, um, the same um, programmer, the type of, of persons in one team, you won't get a diversity of thought, even though designer, uh, there's a designer and a developer in there. Um, you also, if you have the possibility, look for, for cultural, cross-cultural teams, not just cross-functional teams, but also cross-cultural teams. Um, people with different background, with different age, senior, junior people, they come up with different solutions, and it's good to have them in one room discussing all these things. So different backgrounds gives you a, a diversity of thought, and that actually leads you at the end to some more creative, stronger solution that your team can build. And then, I already said that, make your team a safe place. Make it a psychological safe place. Speak to each other. Speak, always, always communicate. That makes actually, that's what Google found out. That makes the difference between normal teams and high performance teams. Listen to each other and handle, handle everything with respect. Respect each other, also very important. Um, so actually here, because your team is actually your safety net. So this is a blog post from someone how he fucked up big times and uh, was, was saved by his team. And this gives you a, 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 an environment where you can try things out. It's okay to fail in that environment because your team backs you up and, 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 and take risks in high performance teams. High performance teams take risks, but you have your team that, that stays behind you, so this is your safety net, actually. 
All right, and those high-performance high teams need also, as a team, you need some rituals and also some refreshments. So rituals on one side, you're doing the same thing always, uh, very important for those, and also some refreshments, something new that gets you out of the routines. Um, what some teams do at Atlassian is, is called a fika. Um, it's a Swedish word for having a coffee together. I don't know if that's really true, but someone from Sweden came to Australia and said, let's have a fika. Uh, so uh, they, they come together once a week, and uh, so, so they, they, they have this, what other, other uh, teams call office hours, where they just say, okay, we're not, we're not really working, concentrating deep on something. We have now two hours where we can sit together as a team, have a coffee together, discuss things, or you can just go over to the designer and discuss things that you ever want to discuss because you know this designer is now available for me. Um, so Ficus is, is one thing, then a, a ritual, what other teams are doing, they sit together on a Friday afternoon and watch some conference videos together. So they, they, they look at the Java Zone uh, web page and then say, oh, let's, let's, let's watch this video here. Um, and then they, they learn together, um, and it's a really a ritual that they do every Friday afternoon, um, and then they go to the weekend. Um, a refreshment could be what, what we have is a... GSD day, get stuff done day, um, where you really get, get, get stuff done. So these uh, days are you rent a, rent, rent a um, meeting room for your team, where you sit not in your normal environment, but in this meeting room, and really get stuff done. Turn off email, turn off chat, and then really get shit done for one day. Maybe refactor your, your software for one day. This is really amazing what you get, get done in one day, actually, if you really concentrate on just, just this. Um, and other, other teams are doing, or a lot of teams at Atlassian are doing innovation weeks. So every five to six weeks, they set one week off to work on their own, own ideas that has something to do with the product. Maybe it comes back into the product and gets on the agenda, but it's just free for everyone working on an open source project uh, that get, Again, that, that, that we use in our product or something like that. Um, so this is for, for Innovation Week to try out, try, try out stuff. But said that teams bond together, great, but teams are made of individuals. They are individuals in teams, we are individuals. So we should, and, and we got motivated by appreciation. So we should high five more often. We say, yeah, great, good. Um, so if you think a person in your team has done a great job or just small things like help you bringing your, uh, um, 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 bring, bring your software on Docker, in a Docker container, run it in a Docker container, great. I didn't have the experience, but this guy had, and so he helped me or she helped me uh, bring that to Docker. Give kudos to those people. We have a system at Atlassian where you can just give kudos, say great jobs. It's just very, very easy. You fill out here this, this ticket here saying why you want to give kudos, who you want to give kudos to, and what. And then you can say, ah, he or she goes to a movie, likes to go to a movie, a movie gift card would be great, and then press create, and the rest is done by our people department. Um, so you just press create, and two days later, this person has a card on his desk saying, hey, kudos from Sven, thank you uh, for running my software in Docker, that's good, that's great, um, and here are your movies, movie tickets. Um, another thing that, that, that is, a, is, is a kind of a ritual or kind, kind, of, kind of stuff in, in the San Francisco office, when they have stand-ups, um, people start clapping if you've done, done your job good. Uh, they start clapping, and this is something that, that is happening in the San Francisco office. Then all of a sudden, the whole office starts clapping. So it's, it's really everyone, and you, you, sometimes you sit there and you don't know why everyone is clapping, and you start clapping too. So this is a really great experience for, for the guy that says, okay, great job, oh yeah, everyone's clapping, that's cool. Um, but also that, as I said, individuals, we, we are different. And we got appreciated also by our role in the company. And a lot of companies, their, their, their career ladder looks like this. Yeah, you got the developer, you've been senior developer, promoted to a developer team lead, developer manager, head of development, you say. But it's not, it's, not every, it's not for everyone. You should have a, a, a second career path or a third career path even. Um, for those who, who don't want to go into leadership, Give them alternatives. So senior developer, lead developer, technical lead. You should, you should build that. All right. This is all good, great, high performance teams. But hi what really high performance teams need is not just that they, in their environment, can do whatever they want. We're working in an organization. 
So we need actually support from the rest of the organization. Just an example here. If you want to want to make deci a decision, you need a lot of information for making this decision. You cannot just make the decision in your team because there's a lot of other stuff in the company going on. Maybe you need some, some, some stuff from the legal department. You need some stuff from the finance department. Marketing must be involved. So there's a lot of information you need to, to go in to make your decision. So where do you get this information from? Yeah, you can do one-on-ones, call somebody, get, get the information. You can write emails, get ask someone. Um, there are probably laying around some documents you can find with some information. Um, set up a meeting with people, uh, that's also possible. Have some random discussions, meet someone at the water cooler or at the coffee table or whatever and have some random discussions. Yeah, there are some rumors going on that this will happen so we can move our decision into that direction. Um, or some Excel sheets that are flying around that you found there were some data in there so to guide your decisions um, and then some uh, something is in the internet um, and that's actually what, what, what we have at Atlassian the internet this is our decision making tool actually I mean we, we also go into meetings and stuff like that and ask people but we put everything into into our intranet this this is where the information lives and I've, I've, I mean, I've been talking to a lot of Confluence customers that set up Confluence and try to make their software development with that. And those instances looks like this. You can see your team space. You can see the company information that, 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 that the press department or whoever provides. And, of course, you can build up your personal pages in your intranet. Great. But there's a lot of locked up in, in the, on those intranet. Um, other teams' goals, no, you're not allowed to see that. Other projects, no, 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 better not. Otherwise, you have feedback for that. We don't want everyone to see that. Strategies or decisions, no, better not. Well, I think it should be more the other way around. So we, we actually say it's open, our, our internet is open by default. We have some lockdown uh, pages, yeah. I mean, we're a public company, so some finance data uh, from the quarter we're not allowed to see, sure. But everything is open by default. You don't have to think, should I lock this page down or not? No, you just everything is open. Uh, if someone wants to discover it, that's fine. So for example, Stan Pettit here, um, he actually wrote down why we develop Bitbucket pipelines, which is a new uh, continuous de de delivery in the cloud um, so, uh, piece of software. And he wrote down all the decisions. So you, you, can, you can really read that what, what, we, what we thought, why we built this, this product. Um, and then you get some more data to dive deeper into that. This is all free available for everyone. Um, and you can, the good thing is also you can, you can jump into the discussion. You can get, get your questions answered. For example, I ask, hey, why, why is it not available for, for server? Why is it just available for the cloud? And then he said, yeah, it's built on cloud services, so we can't really put that on, 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 on behind the firewall. So that's a good reason, okay, I understand that. But if you have questions, you can just ask, ask that directly here. And also, allow corrections. Why shouldn't other people edit your, your page? Why, why do you just make it read only? I mean, they can write, okay, this, this page is out of date, here's the new one, great. Or um, there's a typo, they can correct it. Or they have more data, actually, they can put it in. So allow corrections, also very, very important. At, at Atlassian, we have this mantra. We say, share it or it didn't happen. So put it into your internet or it didn't happen. Well, our internet called EAC, extranetatlassian.com, so it calls EAC it or it didn't happen. And it's, it's also very important for, we, we are a distributed company. We have offices in Sydney, uh, San Francisco, uh, in, in, in Amsterdam. And it's, it's, it's very important that everyone knows, get, gets the information fast. So actually, Don Brown, the remote worker, he wrote a blog post, why is it important to EAC it or it didn't happen? Um, and, and I'm a remote worker too, so I think this is a great, great way to be at the company, to know what's going on, um, if everything is, if you know everything is an EAC. And we call this also a value of ours, open company, no bullshit. Everything is open by default. Now, said that, this also is, is, is a little bit risky. Um, to have everything open because discussions come up. Um, for example, somebody put up that page. That got a lot of traction here. Um, bring your own device policy. 
So honestly, that was a pretty strict bring your own device policy that somebody wrote up here. So uh, people were reading it and ranting about it. So we got very, very passionate discussion with people saying, uh, I'm not productive anymore. I won't check my emails at home if this is the new direction. So really, really bad. Um, but this actually happens if you're an open company. Be aware, this can happen. So w what happened is uh, Mike Cannon Brooks, our founder, jumped in and said, hey, stop the discussion. We take this offline now. We look at all your feedback and change this, this policy so everyone is happy. But on the other side, think about what you say to your teammates. They put in their heart and minds and, and a lot of time investment into that policy. They, they, are not we are not, they are not stupid. They got hired by us, so they are not stupid. So play as a team. Stay together and don't rant, rant about this uh, too much. Be constructive in, in your feedback. So this is really important if, you, if you're being open, open uh, by default. This, this will happen. Um, and we had that actually from day one. There's a lot of examples where, where we had a big, big discussion where we say, okay, stop, stop it here. We take it offline and, and put together a team that works on that. So open information should be open. But sometimes information is, you, you need some, some support from, from, the, from, from real people, so some help. Also here, make that easy to discover help. So for example, if you want to open source something, open source a library, you probably have to go to your boss, to your legal department, yada, yada, yada. Well, so we have actually a ticket for that. So you can just enter that ticket, say what you want to open source, why you want to open source it, and submit it. So the right people gets that. You can follow up on that. So, or if you want to have SSH access. I, I remember that I, that I was working in a, in a company and it took, took them half a week or a week to get me SSH access on a specific server because nobody knew who has the right password for that server, who can set up this, which admin is responsible for that. Well, here I just get it in and I know the right people are getting the ticket, reading it, and I get SSH, get SSH, SSH access within, within hours. Um, or who should I contact to get a bike in Amsterdam? If I want to travel to Amsterdam uh, to our office, who to, should I contact? I don't know. Well, I just file a ticket and then I get a bike. Um, so all these ticket types should be discover are discoverable. So we have this help center where you can just enter your question and you get the right ticket type and then you can submit just a ticket that you can follow up, you can comment on that, you have the right person that, that reads that. Um, but that also means you should wait for others, for other people. Really? That's, that takes time, uh, actually. Waiting for other people, that is uh, annoying. So why not just do a self-service? Do it yourself. So for example, if you want to have a, 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 a legal contract reviewed by legal, you don't have to do that. You can just do it yourself. I mean, we can read. So we can read this contract and say, looks good. That's okay. Um, so we have this, this, this desk here where you can just say, okay, the contract is under 25K, good. Then you get a couple of questions. If you all answer them with no and press create, your contract is legally approved. It's, it's approved. You don't have to go to a legal person. The risk is not as high as, uh, as, 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 it's not very high, and you can use your own judgment if this is a risk for the company or not. Um, or if you need to change the UI, you need a designer to do that? No, do it yourself. So our design team, the first thing they, they did when they came together is uh, put together this design guidelines. And they are open, actually, you can go to design at design.atlassian.com um, and, and look at them. They are open, you can, you can see them. And it, it tells you which colors you should use, which, which uh, components we have. And if you want to use a component, there's probably already a component there. So you can look that up and use that component. We have some web components there. If you want to use a date picker, everything is documented there, so you can just grab it and use it. Um, or need QA for, for, for testing your software, if you want to have a test, your software tested, do it yourself. So as developers, we are writing automated tests. Of course we're doing that. So if the test fails, it's very easy for us to fix. We can code, we can fix it, great. But for the, the QA people, for the testers, if they're doing manual tests and they find a, find, find, find a bug in there, well, they have to tell us developers, we fix it and they test again. Well, shouldn't do that, it's a failure. We actually train our developers to be, um, to be better testers. 
they actually know how to test software. It's not just from day one, if you start, you can just test as a, as a developer, but we train them so they can actually be better testers. Um, we send them on courses, we sit together with them, and then they can code and test their software themselves. The only checkpoint for QA is actually we do kickoffs together with, with, that, uh, with, with that developer. So they sit together and look, look at the feature, look what, what, what is necessary to test here, and then you can go and, and start developing and testing. Um, and at the end, we are doing open demos, so the QA people can come and look at what we did and ask questions, have you tested this or this or this? These are just the two checkpoints for QA um, at Atlassian. Or if you need a user test, you have a great idea, you want to put that in your software and you, you need a real user to test that, is that really the workflow that, that, that normal users do? Do it yourself. Get, get a user. So we actually build your prototype and then you can rent a test lab. There's a test lab set up in, in Sydney and in Austin. So uh, no matter in which office you, you work, you can uh, rent this test lab and there are users always coming, always invited. So if you're a Jira developer, you know every Thursday there's a Jira day, so there are coming some Jira's, Jira users. Um, so you can rent that on the Thursday, this test lab, and run your, your tests with your prototype yourself. Um, it's, it's very easy, so there's just a room set up uh, with a computer, microphone, a camera, and a user. And then we live stream that to another room, so the whole team can actually watch how this user uh, tries out your prototype, and, and then it looks like a little bit like this. So you do some, some interviews with that person and show them the software. And it's just set up by, by developers. Somebody is documenting all this. And uh, you, can, you can actually test, test, uh, rent this test lab on your own. So really, enable your team to do stuff yourself, themselves. So it's very, very important so that you don't have to wait for someone that they rent a test, test lab, they set this test lab up, they invite the users, but just make it easy for them to do, do it yourself. So make asking for help easy and enable teams to do stuff themselves. Very important. Now, you might say, how do you know all this stuff? I mean, I'm, if you start at Atlassian, how do you know all this? There's the service desk for renting a bike, there is this test lab, um, there, there's this QA policy. How, how do you know all this stuff? Well, you have to be a long-term employee to know all this stuff, of course. Um, but we wanted to give people a boost at the beginning. So give new employees a boost. Um, for those who have been here last year in my talk, I already said that we are, we are doing a boot camp. So in the first weeks, we're trying to teach people the basics of, of Atlassian. Not, not of software development or whatever, it's just the basics so they can start running. It's very important. Sometimes you get kicked in a new job, you get the task, but you lose the basic. You don't know who to contact in the legal department, how, uh, how, how QA is, 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 is set up in your, in your organization. So that's very important. So for the first, it's, it's in the first weeks and it's lessons by employees. So they, they totally run that themselves. So it's lessons by employees. And you can, you can uh, just put in your schedule together here. Uh, think like a designer or how to estimate better. So stuff like that. So lessons offered by Atlassians and you can just pick whatever you want in your first weeks for, for your bootcamp lessons. Because if you start at a new company, this is, uh, it's, it's very, very stressful because you get this new workplace. You get new team members on your team uh, that, you, that you need to know. And the worst thing are the new acronyms that you have to learn. Um, I remember that by heart. All, all these new acronyms, I didn't know what they were talking about. Um, sounds like a di different language to me. New work style. It's a new style of work and then the new processes. This is all what you need to, need to learn when you start. It's very important that you do that, that you learn that to, to do a great job. Um, but, of course, you want to show that you're good. You want to show off. You want to show, yeah, I'm the right one. You hired the right guy or the right girl for this, for this job. So how can you make sure that people really concentrate first on the basics before they trying to, to uh, show what, what, what they can do? Um, so what we do is actually with every employee, we do it this 90-day plan. So we, set, we, we come together from, the, from day one and set up this 90-day plan um, with them. So to set 
set clear goals, what we expect. We don't expect miracles from you in the first 90 days. We expect you to settle at Atlassian. That's very important. Um, so this is a 90-day plan. Um, so you see week, in, uh, week, week one check-in, just get to know the team. Then we have some other check-ins here. Um, and then what you learn, I know Atlassian, I know my role, I know my team, yada, yada, yada. That's very important for you to do a great, great job to settle in that, in that hype, in that, in that team. So very important. But also bring, bring people into the code base. Don't just throw them in the code base. Do some pair programming with them, also very important. Sit together with new people, do some pair programming, and uh, do code reviews. So set them up to code reviews so they get to know the code base better. Um, but also the other way around. We want to know who's, who's the new hi who are the new hires to know, okay, this is a new, new person in the, let's say, people department. I can go to this person if I have, have a problem. Um, so what, th what they do in the Austin office is they call Friday family breakfast. So they come together every Friday and um, they, the new people, so the new hires, and if you're visiting the office for the first time, you have to get up, introduce yourself and tell what you're doing, uh, where, where you come from, which office, or if you're in which department you're working on, and then you have to do one of those. Tell a most embarrassing story, share a hidden tattoo, secret tattoo, or show your hidden talent. And that's very funny, I, I always like the hidden talent one, um, when people show their hidden talent, um, very, very funny. So this is also a way to get to know, to bond better in, uh, also in the broader team. All right, so the last ingredient of, of successful software teams is a shared mindset. Have a shared mindset inside your team. So how do you build the team knowledge? You want to build a team knowledge that everyone knows what's, what's important here and what other people are working on. So you probably have this person on your team that is the senior developer, the one that fixes the bugs because he or she knows the, the software the best. So this is your bug fix person. Um, but of course, that's not good. You want to share that knowledge uh, throughout the team. So you can, it's first, it's very boring to just work on bug fixing, not on, on new stuff. Um, and, and second, um, if that person drops out, where's the knowledge? It's gone. So what we do is actually we, we send, we, we do a bug fix, what we call a bug fix rotation. So every week, there's a new person have to work on bugs, on bug fixing. So we send people on bug fix rotation to, to share the team knowledge uh, better. Another thing that we do is if you work on a feature alone, on your own, it can be very drowning. Um, so because, I mean, you probably have your user story, you know what to do, you talk to the designers, you know how to, how to work with that, how to, how, to, how to build that feature. But then developing features is a, is a process, and you have a lot of small decisions that you make day in, day out. Of course, the big decisions you can bring back to your team, should we do it this way, this way, or that way, but you're alone with your small decisions, and you don't want to interrupt every time other people to say, uh, how would you deal with that, uh, and, and, and stop them working. So they, they don't know your feature that much, so get a buddy. That's what we do. So if you're working on a feature, you get a feature buddy. So someone that is also familiar with that feature and can give you feedback and it's okay to, sh to, to, to interrupt, uh, interrupt that person if you want to get feedback on something. So we work intensively with feature buddies. Um, that's also something we, wanna, we do. Another thing, if you have a bright idea and you, want, wanna, wanna, you don't know if that idea is good or not, how do you bring that to the team? How do you, how do you test the waters here? So in the coal mine back in the days, they had this canary bird. And they were testing the air in the coal mine with this canary bird. Um, and if the canary bird died, they know, okay, the air is poisoned. We have to immediately get out here. Um, and we're doing something with, with ideas too, like that. We call it canary sessions. So we, we set a time, each team meeting, half an hour, where someone can run their, their ideas with a team and test the waters test their ideas, get feedback on their ideas. And that's a specific time where just, it's, if, if it's a stupid idea, great, try to, there are no stupid ideas. So try, try it out and get feedback if, if you think this idea, and get feedback from your team to see if this idea sticks. Then we're doing this in a team environment too. We call agile slams. 
I don't know, it comes from poetry slams. It actually has nothing to do with poetry slams. I don't know why they call it adder slams. Um, I think somebody thought it sounds cool, so let's do that. Well, so what it is, 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 is actually like a brown bag. So they, they do sessions like how to estimate better. Um, so they, they, there, there's one, one person going up and discussing that and then starting this team discussion together with the team. So team discussions are very, very important. Bring the team in on your new ideas, on, 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 your, on the processes in, in the team to improve that. So bring in your team to discussions and also share your work with the team. So for example, the design team, they have these big design walls where they share their ideas on, on, on that. And then you can give feedback here. You can just say, okay, this I don't like, this I don't, this looks good. Um, so share also your work that you've done. Um, as I said, with open demos, so we have these open demos too, where people can just join and see what we've been developing. So share, share your work too to the rest of the team. So doing the right things, actually doing, doing things right. You have to build processes to do things right. If you, if you want to have good quality, you probably have a process for code reviews. If every line of code gets reviewed, um, your quality will increase. Great. Uh, we've been working a lot with processes in the past. But what's more important now for teams is not, not doing things right. It's doing the right things. And this is just if you, if you build adaptability into your team. Your team needs to adapt different situations. And this is where, well, this is also the difference between normal teams and high performance teams. High performance teams can adapt very, very fast because teams are different. If you set processes, you probably have processes for the whole organization. But your team is different and, and acts different and do things the team way. But sometimes you want to get inspired by other teams, what they do. So sometimes you need some, some guidance, what, how, how you can envision an idea or Built during build and building the software, how do you improve things in, in the software? And there are certain, I wouldn't call it patterns, but also, also not good practices, but there are certain, certain things that teams do actually to, to improve that. Um, and we have put that all together into, into a playbook. So we have a playbook with 40 plus plays in it um, to guide our project teams. And it's, it's helping them actually with some place, and I'm, I'm jumping into the place uh, right after, so it's helping them to envision their software better, to be on the same page um, with stuff. It's just a guidance, you don't have to do that. Um, and it's different from team to team what works for the team, but here are some, some guidance what you can do. So it's of course not a book, um, it's, it's a page. Uh, so each, each play has its own page, and. It says how many prep time you need, how, how, how long does it take, uh, how many people can, and how difficult it is. Um, and then you can see the purpose, the materials you need, um, all the sets written down, how to play this play, um, and then how to wrap up. So let's, let's, let's jump right into a play. A play could be concept testing. This is one of our plays that we have in our playbook. If you want to test a concept, here's a good practice that other teams um, have done that works. So, for example, concept testing is do your things on a paper prototype, so print it out, the mock-up, how it will look like, invite some users, explain the users how the prototype will work or how the, how the software will work on the, on, the, on the piece of paper, and then give them some stickers to vote. And this is concept testing. So they can put their stickers where they think things go wrong or if they like this in general or not, this idea. Um, another play would be a project poster to get a shared understanding of what we are building. So also here, it's just a template um, of, a, of a project poster. So what are we doing? Why are we doing this? How would a possible solution look like? Yada, yada, yada. So it brings, it concentrates you on what you want to build and why you want to build it. And if there's other people know, want to know, hey, what, wh why are you doing that? You can just uh, point them to that page and say, hey, this is our project poster. Look at that. So. As I said, we have, we have plenty of this place, and some, some of this place you've probably known, brainstorming, um, stand-ups is a play here, um, so retrospective is a play. So all these things, how to do them, are in this, in this playbook. Um, we will bring that to public, our, our place, so we will uh, probably release some 20 or 25 of this place within the next three weeks. So 
uh, watch the news. Um, I, I can't share a URL with you right now, but uh, we will bring that so you can, you can see what we mean with the playbook. All right, so compelling direction, very important. Show your, your team where you're heading. Um, supportive context. Get the whole organization to help your team, to enable your team to be high performance. Have a strong structure, cross-functional teams, um, and a psychologically safe place. And get a shared mindset, what you're working on and, and about your, your software. So, how awesome is your team? Is it good? You like your team? Yeah? Well, we don't ask how awesome is your team, we ask actually how healthy is your team? Is your team healthy and can you measure that? And we have actually developed certain checkpoints where you can measure the health of teams. Um, so first would be, so these are the eight checkpoints. Does your team have a full-time owner? Or does your project have a full-time owner? Um, is it a balanced team? Do you have different, categ different people in your team? Is it balanced? Um, do you have a shared understanding what your goals are? Do you, do you have values and metrics how to measure your success? Also, can you provide an end-to-end -end demo for your project? Is that possible? Do you have something where people, you can point people to read about the project? What are the goals? Um, what are you working on? What are the possible solutions? Um, do you have figured out all dependencies of this? So have you figured out well, who are the stakeholders? What are the problems here? Um, and is your velocity okay? So, and you just vote each week you come together and measure your team's health and you just vote, oh yeah, my team is healthy, it's a little bit sick on that, on that uh, checkpoint, or it's, it's really sick, um, so we really have to do something. So we have this, this health check, actually nearly every team at Atlassian are now doing that since two years, and we have big success with that. So um, this, is, this is something that you know, okay, I'm good at that, but I have to really work more on, on our shared understanding. Um, so that, that doesn't seem to work for our team. All right, so this one we have set up, atlassian.com slash health monitor. You can, you can uh, read that. It's not, not a tool as a software tool, but it's a tool for teams uh, that you can just use immediately, um, no matter if you put that on a, on a Confluence page or put that on a, just on a poster, wherever you want. So go there and, and look at the health monitor if you're interested. So your health is red. What now? What should you do? Damn it, what, what should I do? My health is red on that one. Well, I should be able to change stuff, to say, okay, good. I, 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 can, I can actually change, change this. I can drive this change forward. So empower teams to, to think and act like, like a founder. A founder would say, okay, let's, let's change this. That, that didn't work. Let's go there. And the founder would say, okay, we have set up this, this process and it didn't work, but yeah, it's, now, it's now implemented, so we can't change it. No, a founder would say, okay, stop it. We're doing that differently. Um, and this is also a, a value that we have at LS and be the change you seek. So we, we are allowed to change things that don't work for our teams. Um, so you could, you could change stuff in your team environment. Our teams have funny names, but that doesn't really uh, tell something for the, show, for the story. So, um, but, but you can change stuff in your, in your team environment. You might say now, but Sven, yeah, great, but there's so much overlapping also. Yeah, but still, you can change stuff in your team environment. And if you, if you need to change stuff that is o an overlapping, talk to the other team. They probably have the same problems. They don't have different problems. They probably have the same problems, and you can talk to them and change things. That's very important. If you want to build high-performance teams, talk, to, talk not just inside your teams, but also talk outside your teams. I started with a rock star. Yeah, the one that is really, really uh, driving the team forward or driving, driving the software development forward. I compared it a little bit like a, a single core processor. Well, really, really powerful. We can, we, we, we can really power it up. Um, but it has actually physical limits. We learned that it's no, not possible to, uh, to, to get more power out of the processor. So what did we do? Yeah, multi-core, multi-core processors. And this is also a little bit a team where we say, okay, maybe we don't have this, just these high power people inside our teams. But when we, when, we, when we work really together, when we really work together and we communicate together, then we can do amazing, amazing things together. So multi-core, but there's a downside, there's communication needed. And also here, 
there's a physical limit um, for how big teams can be because each team member that you add is, 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 uh, is more communication. So also here, good team sizes, six to eight people. Um, but there's, there's no excuse not to team up. We need to work in teams to be awesome. Thank you.